Blog Talk Radio. Welcome to our program on Kardec Radio. And now, here's our host, Dr. Vanessa Ancelone. Welcome, dear listener, to Kardec Radio. Today, we are here live at the Chantilly Studios of Kardec Radio. And we're going to dedicate the program to understanding more about the scientific perspective on reincarnation. Yes, we have here with us Dr. Jim Tucker, who leads the legacy of Dr. Ian Stevenson and went far and beyond. He is now launching a new book entitled Return to Life. Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Past Lives. And he dedicates this book specially to memories of children who were born in the United States. We have here mm-hmm. a book that uniquely was was compiling stories about young children who report memories of previous lives and were born in the United States. A country in which some people may believe in reincarnation, but it's not a widespread belief or understanding, if we may say this way. It's a fascinating book that is now available at Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, anywhere you go. Just Google it, and you're going to find the book. Order it, because it's fascinating. We are about to get into the holiday season, and this book is actually a book that will help many people understand about their lives, their family relationships, because it's going to get us to understand about the continuity of life and the fact that we live many lives. And very soon, we're going to open the line for Dr. Tucker so he can tell us about interesting cases, as he says, extraordinary cases, cases of children who remember previous lives and cases in which some, some of these children actually had experiences related to Hollywood life. Well, it's quite intriguing something really to meditate about. And if you want to ask your questions to Dr. Tucker, just write to us at the Blog Talk Radio chat room or call us at 858-769-4705. It's a toll-free number, and we'll be happy to open the line for you. If you want to send your question also to the cardecradio.com website, we have a contact form, and we're going to get this line open for you. As you know, Alan Kardec himself had the opportunity to groundbreak the understanding of reincarnation. Understanding that we don't reincarnate in the body of animals, we actually reincarnate to progress. In the Spirit's book, there are chapters dedicated solely to understanding about how reincarnation happens how it's planned, etc. But never before, Dr. Stevenson and Dr. Tucker, we had people investigating so thoroughly about reincarnation. It's actually about life after life. We are naming it reincarnation because we at Kardec Radio, we already understand that reincarnation is a fact in life. For those who are still contemplating, you may call it anything you want. We're just talking about being born again in a new body, the body of a baby, but being a millennial soul. Well, because we're pre-holiday season and many of you celebrate Christmas, it's about thinking of Jesus. It's about the Christ coming to the earth and opening a new perspective in our lives. It's beyond the religion. It's about humanity. It's about the golden rule, doing to others what you'd like others to do unto you. It's about setting up a new pattern in in our relationships. It's about bringing love. So, to kickstart the program in the tone that we'd like to set in for the show today, we have here a message named Christmas Card. And it's in the book and CD, Enlightening Messages. You can buy it at the Spiritist Society of Baltimore's website, www.ssbaltimore.org. And you know that's a perfect gift for anyone in this holiday season as well. Right after this message in the break, 
in a few minutes. We will open the line for Dr. Tucker to teach us more about the amazing findings of his research at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville. Christmas Card At the dawn of Christmas, which awakens in you the music of hope, listen to the voice of someone who searches for the nest of your soul. Someone who lights up the star of generosity in your eyes and sweetens your feelings as though he had a harp of tenderness hidden in his chest. Yes, it is Jesus, the faithful friend who has returned. Even if you did not want to, today you would remember your sacred graces. As you recall your mother's songs at your cradle, your father's care when he held you in his compassionate arms, the patience of the teachers who guided you in school, and the pure love of old friendships that appear to you to be far away. You contemplate the street where lights and carols honor his glory. However, you fall over the weight of tears which cleanse your heart. It is so because he speaks to your soul, pleading for forgiveness for those who stumble, help for those who suffer, a coat for those who tremble in the vastness of night, consolation for those who groan discouraged, and light for those who lay in darkness. Do not hesitate. Hear his petition and do something. Smile again at those who have offended you. Bless those who have wounded you. Share your bounty with your brothers in need. Give one minute of solace to the sick. Offer a piece of bread to those who pray alone above ruins and abandoned bridges. Extend a soft bedsheet to those who await death without the coziness of a home. Give up a small sum of your wallet towards helping worn out mothers who suffer seeing their small children squirm with hunger or make happen the happiness of a forgotten child. It does not matter if you say that you cultivate goodwill only today when Christmas shines on you. Let's start to live with Jesus even if it is for a couple of hours every now and then and we will learn little by little to be with him always as much as he is with us coming daily into our intimacy and sustaining us forever we will return to our program after these messages New release, Liberation. In this compelling narrative, André Luiz emphasizes the work of high-order spirits in the effort to convert the spirit Gregorio to the good, an effort that culminates with the unforgettable re-encounter with his mother, herself a highly evolved spirit, wherein he surrenders to the irresistible call of love. The book also contains information on how unhappy spirits act as they try to involve incarnates in their wiles. The spirit author tells of the intercession of high-order spirits on behalf of human beings, demonstrating the divine compassion that grants to all the blessed opportunity to free themselves by means of study, labor, and persevering service in the practice of the good. Buy your copy today at www.edicei-of-america.com. Spread the word. Kardec Radio. To learn more about Spiritism. Want Spiritist books for your children? At Eddie Save America, you will find a collection of them. From the best selling book, Our Father, in which the spirit May May through Chico Xavier brought countless poems, stories, and folk tales based on the Lord's Prayer, to the beautiful and educational collection by the author Adelison Siles on Back to School and many others. 
Buy your copy today at www.eddiesaveamerica.com. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. If you missed out on previous shows, no worries. We have an on-demand sections of all previous shows and interviews. Go to our website, www.kardecradio.com. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. Spiritism for Everyone, the online study of Spiritism. This year with the in-depth study of the book Genesis by Alan Kardec. Join us every Wednesday evening through the web from any computer or mobile device, no matter where you are in the U.S. or the world. Spiritism for Everyone is free, open to all, and requires no registration. For more information, go to www.spiritus.us. Spiritism for Everyone is a program of the United States Spiritus Council. And now we return to our program. Dear listener, we are here to talk about The Return to Life. It's actually a book that was just released by Dr. Jim Tucker. Jim Tucker is Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He is continuing the work of Dr. Stevenson at the University of Virginia Division of Perceptual Studies with children who report memories of previous lives. He's a board-certified child psychiatrist who worked with Dr. Stevenson for several years before taking over the research of Dr. Stevenson's retirement in 2002. He was born and raised in North Carolina, and he was actually raised a Southern Baptist. Thus, he never considered seriously the idea of reincarnation before reading one of Dr. Stevenson's book. Thank you so much, Dr. Tucker, for being with us at Kardec Radio once again, and especially at this time when you're launching this amazing book. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for having me. It's amazing because you were born and raised Southern Baptist, and how did it happen that you became acquainted with Dr. Stevenson's work? Well, I had certainly not considered reincarnation when I was growing up, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, then when I did my training in psychiatry and child psychiatry at the University of Virginia, um, I heard about Ian Stevenson because he had previously been chairman of the department, uh, but I never met him, and, and it was just sort of a mild curiosity on my part. Uh, once I finished training, I went into private practice and uh, was just having sort of a normal typical practice when uh, my wife and I got together, she was open to things like reincarnation. Mm -hmm. And being with her was sort of an awakening for me in, in many ways, but it, it did get me curious about the topic. So that's what led me to be reading one of Ian's books uh, when we saw in the local newspaper that the that his research division had gotten a grant to do a new study on near-death experiences. Uh, feeling a little unfulfilled in my private practice, I, I called out the division to see if they needed help interviewing patients uh, just on a volunteer basis. And uh, sort of one thing led to another. I started uh, going every week for a couple of hours and, and then eventually um, came on halftime and, and now here I am. <laughs> That's amazing. That's really so interesting how things get to to the level that you are now, uh, really leading the legacy. How was it working with Dr. Stevenson? Well, it was great. I mean, he, he was always very supportive. Uh, but in addition, I really liked the approach he took, where it was being as scientific and analytical as possible, addressing this question of, of life after death. So it was taking what is, is often viewed as kind of a spiritual or religious issue and, and applying uh, a scientific approach to it. Exactly. So you have been work you were working with him and you kept the legacy, and you actually expanded it because you opened a new door that was never emphasized that much. In this book, Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Previous Lives, Return to Life, you uh, compiled for the reader, after 50 years of research in the projects of University of Virginia, cases of children in the United States 
who remember previous lives. So were these cases that you alone investigated, or was it cases that also Dr. Stevenson had investigated when you were working with him? Well, the, the first case in the book is one that he and I investigated together. That was actually the first case I studied. Mm-hmm. Um, but then after that, the, the others are mine. And, and I mean, you're right. He had focused on, on cases in places with a, a general belief in reincarnation because it's easiest to find cases there. Mm-hmm. Um, so w- once he started publishing his books, he did hear sometimes from American parents. Uh, but then once we set up our website 15 years ago, then we started hearing from more and more. And, and um, I decided to focus on the American ones because, uh, for one thing, they don't have the co- potential cultural influences that, that the cases from, from Asia or from Brazil or wherever might have. Mm-hmm. And two, um, you know, if, a, if a couple of thousand cases of, of Ian's from Asia hadn't convinced people to take a look, then I didn't feel like there was any number of cases that would, but with these American ones, that this is something kind of different that, that hopefully people will um, seriously consider. So how in general did these cases come to you as a psychiatrist at first, right? Well, yes, but not, not in the clinic. I mean, they didn't come to me as patients, but there are people where the parents would have their kids saying these things and be... Um, concerned or, or curious about them anyway, and, and then they find us on the Internet. And so most of them then email me, and, and we take it from there. Mm, okay, but usually parents must be very unsettled, especially in the United States, when children start reporting such experiences, and the reports don't come out of... Uh, they come together with behavioral things and issues as well, Correct. Well, that's right. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of the parents are concerned because in addition to the statements, uh, the kids may be having terrible nightmares, for instance. Uh, they may be um, uh, doing things in their play that, that seem quite unusual. They may have phobias, which uh, in our cases where the previous person died by an unnatural death, meaning murder, suicide, or, or accident, 35% of those kids will have a phobia toward that mode of death. Um, so, yeah, so there are these behavioral issues that do get parents concerned, and, um, and, and that's often part of, of what leads them to contact us. And isn't it true that some of these issues also affect their relationship with the children? For example, children who strange start estranging their parents or they start uh, being prone to finding new parents or... Uh, other relationships and par- parents may be very um, worried about what to do. Isn't that in some of the cases what well, you think? Yeah, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, there, there are kids who um, are crying every day saying they miss their their parents mm-hmm. uh, or, or miss people from their lives. They may be begging their, their actual parents to, to take them to see their other ones. Wow. Um, and, and there are kids who will say, uh, you're not my mom. My mom, you know, looks different or lives in such and such place, and and yeah, so that can be a real strain uh, on the relationship when the child is young. That's for sure, and especially in this book, you decided to publish, and it's about the cases in the United States. And uh, how, what do you think this far uh, has been the receptivity of people? Uh, regarding the book, I know it's just launched, but you probably got some feedback already. Uh, yes, well, you know, you never know who's open to this kind of thing. First of all, um, I, I think the reception has certainly generally been positive. Uh, the the um, uh, the alumni magazine here at the University of Virginia just published a, a story on the work, and then it generated all kinds of, of comments, some good and some bad, uh, mm-hmm. but certainly a lot of interest in the idea of, of trying to approach this topic in, in a scientific way. I see, yes, and, and that's the, 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 the key point of this book. Um, it's about the evidence that previous lives exist. So what can you tell us about specifically on your theory on how consciousness transcends space and time? I know Dr. Stevenson used the term diathanatic elements, right? 
Um, I don't remember that term. He, he used the term psychophore, which was his idea of this um, uh, entity that would carry uh, memories or emotions or whatever onto another life. Um, yeah, I, I think trying to come up with a theory about how all this works is mm-hmm. um, is challenging. And and it can certainly be kind of complicated, but uh, uh, the way that the approach I've taken is to not just map these cases onto our understanding of reality, but but to look and see whether our understanding of reality needs to to be um, changed. And and uh, you know when you look at at findings from quantum physics, which of course is a, is a very complicated area, but when you look at those findings. Uh, I think a good case can be made that physical reality grows out of consciousness um, in, in more or less the same way that our nighttime dreams grow out of, of our one mind um, in, in the same way that, that the physical universe may grow out of, of all of our minds together. And if, if that's the case, if you consider consciousness a separate entity from the physical world, mm-hmm. then it makes sense that it wouldn't be limited by a physical brain and, and wouldn't end when the physical brain dies, but but instead would continue. Mm-hmm. And then in our cases, uh, it, it certainly appears that that, that consciousness then uh, becomes associated with, with a new brain and, and then uh, leads a, a child to have memories of a past life. So then, for example, because we are at Kardec Radio and we're talking about sometimes Kardec's works, uh-huh. and uh, Kardec talks about the spiritual body. You know, nowadays we could call like a quantum body. And uh, would would you say it's possible that there is like uh, the transfer of the memories of this life that can be almost like uploaded, as we say in computer language, uploaded into the spiritual brain or the quantum brain, and that when associated with a new body, can be downloaded into the new body. Would you say that this is a, a possibility? Well, yes, and I think uh, I think you can view things that, that we have sort of our, our personality and, and our, um, our mind in this life, but there may be sort of a larger mind that we have that kind of transcends our lives. So, yeah, I mean, the, our experiences in this life... Um, can be uploaded, if you want to use that word, to sort of our, our bigger minds. And then, at least in, in the cases of these kids, sometimes that they get sort of downloaded again in, into the uh, to the next life and, and the, the kids have the memories. Uh, but, of course, it's not just memories. It's also emotions as well. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's not just knowledge that's being sort of uploaded or downloaded, but but it's it's more the experiences that are. Mm-hmm. And, uh, well, in this case, the implications of the, the the fact that you've been investigated probably can create a new paradigm for treatments in uh, child psychiatry. Is that right? Well, that's right. Although that's a very speculative area. I mean, I, I think uh, w- we certainly don't have any studies of... of trying to use these concepts and in, in doing uh, therapy with children. And, of course, I mean, there are plenty of issues in a current life that, that could cause a child problems that, that need to be addressed. But uh, certainly having kind of a spiritual outlook as you're looking at, at kids and their problems can, can be helpful. Mm-hmm. Dr. Tucker, we are going to give a very short break, but when we come back, we'd like to keep discussing about uh, the what birthmarks may may be that that they may be a sign that their previous lives exist okay we'll talk about it as soon as we come back okay. after the break we will return to our program after these messages books of andre louise through the hands of the most prolific medium of all times chico javier the spirit doctor andre louise wrote a series of books that unveil the mechanisms of life and life after life from the best-selling novel, No So Lar, Our Home, to And Life Goes On, the reader will find illumination for a fulfilled life on Earth as well as immortal happiness. Check the many titles available at the international distributor, E-D-I-C-E-I of America. Their website is www.edic. 
CEIofamerica.com. Spread the word. Kardec Radio. To learn more about Spiritism. Spiritist Network. Your gateway to on-demand Spiritist videos. www.spiritistnetwork.com Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. Traveling to another country? Immigrating elsewhere? Prepare yourself by reading the book Among Brothers of Other Lands, in which several loving and wise spirits wrote through the hands of Chico Xavier and Waldo Vieira, telling all of us the tips and hints of a successful transition to a new land. Buy your copy today at www.edicieofamerica.com. Do you want Spiritist books for your children? At Edisa of America, you will find a collection of them from the best-selling book, Our Father, in which the spirit may may, through Chico Xavier, brought countless poems, stories, and folk tales based on the Lord's Prayer to the beautiful and educational collection by the author Eda Yusson Salis on Back to School and many others. Buy your copy today at www.adesayofamerica.com. And now we return to our program. We are here today talking about return to life. Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Previous Lives, which is the recently launched book by Dr. Jim Tucker. Dr. Jim Tucker has traveled the country meeting families, hearing stories like this, the the one about the two-year-old boy in Louisiana who remembers being a World War II pilot who shut down over the Pacific. And uh, he tells stories about American kids who remember previous lives. Very interesting cases. And as Dr. Deepak Chopra says, this book is very um, interesting because it shows a scientific theory on how to, to explain this consciousness transcendence of space and time and brings a scientific paradigm to us, making us really rethink about life, relationships. The implications are many, dear listener. It's beyond the fact. The fact, but the implications is something that we need to meditate about. Before we go there, Dr. Tucker is here with us, and we are honored by his presence. Dr. Tucker, before the break, we were talking about some of the the the, the theories behind it, but it's evident that birthmark since dr stevenson's work in one of his books um he talks about birthmarks being like a sign sometimes that there is this uh transcendence of these elements from one life to the next can you tell us more to the reader what birthmarks may represent in regards to life after life yeah these are cases where the child is born with a birthmark or sometimes even a birth defect, usually that matches wounds on the body of the previous person, usually the fatal wounds. Um, so, yeah, Ian published a, a book uh, with over 200 such cases, and um, it was 2,000 pages long mm-hmm. because uh, Ian did his usual thorough approach. Um, but it, it appears that um, sometimes the... I would say the consciousness gets affected by the, these traumatic events and then carries the mental images of, of the events uh, with it. And we know sometimes from other work that mental images can have very specific effects on the body. And, and in this case, if the consciousness moves to a new developing fetus, uh, it appears to have those those mental images appear to have effect on the fetus as it's developing, and, and so the child uh, is then born with a birthmark or birth defect that, that matches the, the wounds the previous person had. Mm-hmm. So in the first case you report in the book Return to Life, you talk about Patrick and Patrick, and there is a, an element about mer- birthmark in this case, correct? That's right. That that was a, a child who um, 
seemed to have been his his deceased half brother reborn and Patrick was born with with three things that um seemed to match things that his brother had been through so he he had the, the uh, one of his eyes was had an opacity where he couldn't see out of it and that matched uh his his half brother had had tumors um that eventually killed him when he, when he was quite young, but including one in his eye, uh, behind his eye, that that made him blind in that eye. In addition, uh, there, the brother had a, a tumor on his scalp that had been biopsied, and that's how the diagnosis was made. Well, Patrick was born with with a lump on his scalp in, in just the same place, and it was it was completely benign, but it was there. And then he also had uh, what really looked like a small cut on his neck and and that matched the area where the large IV had been put in his his uh the half brother for the chemotherapy treatment to go in uh so so these were all things that would have had a significant impact on the half brother things that he would have remembered and then it, it seemed that um they had an effect on, on Patrick as he was developing, so he was born with these things. In addition, uh, th- the boy, because of tumors in his leg, uh, limped, and then once Patrick got old enough to walk, he had a slight limp, even though there was no medical reason for it that anybody knew of. Mm-hmm. Uh, but when we saw him, he was five at that point, and, and he still, you could tell he was favoring one leg, and it, it matched the way that, that the half-brother had walked. So for some people, they would claim that probably the mind of the mom that still had the strong impressions about the other child could have imprinted these elements in the body of Patrick. Is that a possibility? Well, it is. If that were the only aspect of the case, it it could be. Uh, And there is a a concept back in the 1800s called maternal impressions, which Mm -hmm. was similar. In in that case, it was that if if pregnant women saw a a really deformed person, that that image could then impact them so much that their child would be born with a similar uh, defect. Um, But you know, the, these cases involve more than just birthmarks. So when when Patrick got old enough to talk, then then he talked about being his his half brother. So it it wasn't just that the the superficial things on the skin or, or whatever um, uh, were there that could have come from from the mom, but but it was memories also. Hmm. So in regards to the the personality of these children. You can tell that there is such a strong element from somewhere else, like a previous life. Can you tell that they have an opportunity to build a new personality in spite of these memories? What is what happens in most of these cases that you have studied? Well, that's an interesting question. I mean, I think um, one thing we do with our cases is we code all of them on, on 200 variables and, and put them in a big computer database so we can run statistics. And there are a few items that we code for personality features, both in the previous person and in the child, uh, like generosity, for instance, is one of them. And what we find is that there is a correlation so that, for instance, the more generous the previous person was, uh, the, the more generous the child tends to be. Uh, but it's certainly not a one-to-one correlation by any means. And, and I mean, we know that genes and environment have a big factor on personality development. Uh, But the the case that Ian made was that there was also this third factor uh, that could influence personality development. Um, We have also done some psychological testing on some of these kids, and Mm -hmm. what we find is that they tend to be quite intelligent. Uh, But other than that, they they certainly don't show any personality problems or or any psychopathology. Uh, Mm -hmm. And and it seems as they um, grow up, they in general, they stop talking about the past life. They get completely wrapped up in this one and, and then go on to, to just have a, a typical development like anyone else. So usually the cases that you report, they happen in what uh, age range? Well, the, the statements about a past life start very early. The, the average age is 38 months. 
uh, just after the third birthday. So we're really talking about two- or three-year-olds typically. Now, occasionally it'll be older, but that's usually when they start. And then most of the kids, by the time they get to be six or seven, they, they stop talking about this. And, and some of them, uh, it appears, still have the memories. They just uh, talk about them. But others uh, seem to remember nothing about it as they get older. Hmm. So what do you think happens after six or seven years of age that uh, probably shuts down the system? What do you think happens? Well, there's certainly a lot of uh, – there, there are a lot of things going on as a child is developing at that age, including a lot of things going on in the brain. Mm -hmm. And it's also the same age when kids lose memories of early childhood. Um, so, for instance, if, if there's a family friend that a child knows when he's two or three, if that friend moves away, most of the time, by the time the child is six or seven, he has no memory of, of the person. Uh, so it would sort of make sense that as, as those – uh, memories uh, don't necessarily disappear, but as it becomes where a person is not able to retrieve those memories, that it would make sense also that the, the person is no longer able to retrieve the past life memories. Mm. So in, in in the cases that you report, and you have a, an extraordinary case that we find related to Hollywood, can you tell us a little bit about that and how peculiar the case may sound to the reader? Yeah, that, that's an interesting one. That's a little boy named Ryan who uh, started, started talking to his mom about, or crying to his mom about missing the life that he had in Hollywood. And he was troubled enough by it that uh, she decided to go check out uh, some books about old Hollywood from the library to see if, if she could show him pictures and, and they would sort of help him uh, process through some of this. Well, they were looking through one of the books one night and – they come to a picture from a, an old movie, a George Raft movie. He was a film star back a long time ago. And Ryan points at the picture and says, hey, that's George. Uh, we did a picture together. And then he points to another guy and says, oh, and that's me. I found me. <laughs> well, the guy he pointed to, it turned out, was an extra who had no lines in the movie. So it took a lot of effort to identify who that person was. Um, but with the help of a Hollywood archivist, eventually we were able to identify him. And in the meantime, Ryan had made a lot of statements about his past life. He, he claimed that he had danced in New York, uh, danced on Broadway, and then he had gone to Hollywood, and he had been in movies for a while. And then he worked at an agency, and he had a big house with a big swimming pool, and, and that his address had the word rock in it. Well, once we finally identified the person, it was a fellow named Marty Martin. And even though it seemed unlikely that an extra from a, a movie would have done all these things, in fact, Marty Martin had. He he uh, had danced on Broadway. He then went to, to Hollywood, and um, after the movie stuff, he, he set up a talent agency and um, was quite successful, had a very large house with, with a large swimming pool, and the address of the house was Roxbury, so it, it matched Ryan's claim that the address had rock in it. Um, so that was one where um, you know, often we're looking to see, is there somebody who died whose life matches the statements that the child has given? Well, in this case, there was only one guy that could match because he had pointed to that picture, and it, it turned out that that one guy did match the, the statements that Ryan had made. Mm, that's so interesting. But now the intriguing part of it is not only this case, but other cases you have studied. We talked about how this personality of the past remains, but... Is there such an, um, a case in which you probably have seen that this personality that they recall sticks, and also because parents reinforce that you know that memory of previous life and the and that the shape up of this new personality being shaped up by the previous one? Do you see such a thing like sticking, for example, in a, in this case, in the case of this Hollywood? Uh, experience it's such a strong memory and how much of that do you think is going to be washed away or is going to stick with the child well that's a really interesting question and we don't know the complete answer to that I mean we haven't um, done 
psychological studies of these kids after they've grown up. Um, in Ryan's case, uh, I mean, there are similarities in the sense that, that he seems very kind of extroverted and um, uh, sort of puts him out, puts himself out there for, for people to see in, in sort of a similar way to, to how Marty Martin did. Um, I don't know necessarily that the parents would encourage it in a case like that, but but we do have ones where the child seems to be a, a previous family member returned. Mm-hmm. Those I can see how it might shape it. So, for instance, if 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 the parents think that a grandfather has been reborn, that they may interact with the child in such a way that, that sort of unconsciously it may shape their personality to form in similar ways because there's this identification that everyone has uh, mm-hmm. with the previous person. Mm-hmm. So with the ones where the previous person was well known to the family, it, it may well be that, that there is some shaping of personality that goes on sort of unintentionally by the parents. So it certainly affects their educational approach to the child. Um, well, that's right. It certainly could. I mean, it can affect all of their approach to the child, again, on, on sort of a um, largely unconscious basis, but um, it, it could certainly make a difference, yeah. yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. that it, it helps parents sort of appreciate their kids even more. So, I mean, especially, again, like with the grandparent where – if they feel like it's their parent returned, then um, sort of the preciousness of life uh, may be there. That sense of that may be there even more than, than it would be normally. Mm. And you also have other cases in the book that you talk about famous names from the past, right? It's one of the chapters in this book. Yeah, there are a couple of cases. I mean, for the the vast majority of these kids – remember someone whose life was completely ordinary other than often the, the way that the previous person died. Um, but there are, we have gotten a couple of cases which I have taken seriously in which the child remembered someone who was at least well-known uh, at the time, not necessarily super famous now. But, for instance, one of the cases in my book in that chapter is a little boy who began, well, at age two, when it got a plastic set of toy golf clubs, just became obsessed with golf. And he eventually discovered the Golf Channel on on his cable television and started saying that he had been Bobby Jones, who was a very well-known golfer back in the 20s. And um, it completely shocked his parents. His parents didn't even play golf. Uh, But in addition, this kid was practically a golfing prodigy so that at at age two, uh, the the local golf club accepted him for lessons even though their normal starting age was age five. But this kid had such a natural ability, a natural swing that they took him early. And his his, uh, abilities continued to progress to to the point that he's been extremely successful on the junior golf tour and at one point won 21 tournaments in a row. So, uh, that was one with, with that sort of talent. Uh, I think it, it adds credence, at least, to, to his belief that, that he was a very good golfer in the past. <laughs> That's so interesting. But, Dr. Tucker, the the most intriguing part of this research for us is how much this so compelling. We have so much evidence this far between, between the works that you've done with Dr. Stevenson, the ones that you continue how much more do you think we, we will need in order for people to really embrace it and, and most of all, to really adopt the implications of such evidence? Well, I think it's there for people to do now if they want. Now, you know, as far as mainstream science overturning its its um, foundational belief in materialism, I, I don't know that that's going to happen, at least in, in my lifetime. Mm. But, um but I think people can take sort of the message from these cases that that there is a, a part of consciousness that can continue on and that, that we hopefully have multiple lifetimes to work on things and to try to make progress. Um, I, I think the evidence is, is there for, for people to do that now if, if they want to. Mm-hmm. Exactly. So it's, it's really... Uh 
it, it's evident. The fact is evident. Now we'd like to give a short break, and when we come back, we'd like to discuss a little bit more with you about the implications of this evidence and how much they can really change everything in our lives, and especially uh, the way we understand the dynamics of the human mind. Okay? Sounds good. We will return to our program after these messages. Want to learn more about the ins and outs of mediumship? The book, In the Realms of Mediumship, by the spirit doctor Andre Luiz, through the medium Chico Xavier, analyzes the various aspects of mediumistic communication and mediumship. He also praises the efforts of mediums who are faithful to the spiritual mandate they received before they reincarnated, warning them about the risks of badly practiced exchanges between the two worlds. Buy your copy today at www.edicei.of.america.com. The Spiritist Magazine is a trimestral, digital periodical that publishes the latest news on the Spiritist thought and the movement in the USA and worldwide at www.spiritistmagazine.com. Spread the word. Kardec Radio. To learn more about Spiritism. Study Spiritism online at eSpiritism. eSpiritism is an online tool to promote the study and practice of Spiritism while contributing to the preparation of Spiritist practitioners. For full access to courses, go to www.e-spiritism.org. If you missed out on any previous shows, no worries. We have an on-demand section of all previous shows and interviews. Go to our website at www.cardacradio.com. Emmanuel's Novels The reputable mentor, Emmanuel, wrote a five-book series of spiritist novels that can truly transform your life. Starting with 2,000 Years Ago, Emmanuel delights our minds with the true account of characters that are so similar to each of us. Discover yourself in Emmanuel's novels and live better. Buy your copy today at www.edicei.com. And now we return to our program. Dear listener, we're in the last quarter of our show. It's about reincarnation from a scientific perspective. When we have here with us Dr. Jim Tucker, who is certainly the leader in the field of research on reincarnation. He is currently the Associate Professor of Psychiatry and Neurobehavioral Sciences at the University of Virginia. He is continuing the work of Dr. Stevenson. If you want to know more about him and his books, From Life Before Life to the recently launched Return to Life, just go to his website, www.jimbtucker.com, jimbtucker.com, and get to know more about this fascinating research that certainly is contains compelling evidence about the fact that we keep on living and we actually come back to the physical form. But Dr. Tucker, why do you think, if, if ever in research you came across such, a, such an explanation, is, is there something that will tell us why we come back to a new reincarnation? Well, that's a good question. And, and I mean, there's the question of whether there is, is even purpose in it or whether it's more of a naturalistic kind of process. Um, I think there may be things that draw us to a particular life uh, in almost sort of a magnetic way. So if there are, say, particular uh, emotions or, or issues, then, then we're kind of drawn to a life that, that can involve those issues. Uh, certainly in, in the same family cases, there may be a very strong emotional pull, both from the person who died as well as the people who are still living, to have that 
consciousness or spirit, whatever term you want to use, mm-hmm. to be with them and, and then be reborn. So uh, there certainly may be explanations like that of, of how we end up in, in the particular place that we do. So you, it constantly reminds us about the emotional component, and it seems to us that when we talk about reincarnation, emotional rearrangement or readjustment may be one of the main features in this life after life. Yeah, well, it certainly can be. For some of the kids, it's a real emotional adjustment to letting go of, of the previous life so that they can get fully engaged in this one. And and then, yeah, beyond that, there may be sort of opportunities to continue to work through particular emotional dynamics or, or issues that, that individuals have. And, and, you know, maybe we don't have to get it all right and get it all perfect in this life that, that we can continue to, to process through things in, in another life. And when we talk about the evidence of reincarnation, Dr. Tucker, it comes to mind the implications. For example, when we got to know that uh, when Pasteur evident, uh, he, he observed that there are germs, it certainly changed the way we, we deal with life in general. So hygiene-wise, Everything changed. Now, what about the implications of this evidence? If reincarnation is so compellingly evident in, in your research, in the research of Dr. Stevenson, how transformative should that be or can that be in our lives? Well, I think it would be more a case of it being transformative in individual lives as opposed to something like germ theory where, where suddenly you know, the, the whole world acted differently. Um, But I think having this awareness that a part of us continues after we die uh, really can impact on how we live during this life. And and, um, I hope that these cases help people understand uh, the value to give to young children, that, that we're all sort of fellow souls that that are in this thing together and um uh is not maybe as as sort of clear cut or straightforward again as germ theory but but I think in a subtle way it I hope can help us appreciate life that much more and, and appreciate the the people around us that much more and and how much do you think the the evidence of reincarnation would change um parents' perspective towards their children. They are just born and knowing that this is a soul that has had previous lives, has experiences, has a baggage. It's not like a whiteboard that I'm going to write on. How do you think that's going to probably change the perspective of uh, education in general? Well, I think... I think it can affect how we view kids in the sense that, I mean, we still remain, we're here to shepherd our parents, I mean, our children, and to guide them. Um, But there's no reason for us to be super authoritarian because, again, in some ways they are equal souls to to their parents. And they need guidance, they, they need limit setting and everything else, but they also need appreciation for for being the the fellow travelers that they are. And uh, we received here a question from England, and Paul has asked the following question regarding collective experiences. Have you come across any case in which uh, more than one kid reports similar uh, memories? Uh, Memories of the same life, you mean, or sharing a life together? Yes, sharing a life together. Like uh, they've experienced something in common and they've report a similar experience that they've lived together. Yeah. Um, the closest that, that I have come... Now, I have heard of cases like that with hypnotic regression, but that's a whole different area um, that has its own uh, potential concerns. But, but with these cases, the closest I've gotten is there are two brothers who... Um, one of them talked a lot about a past life, and then there was one night where the other one sort of joined in. And um, th- there have been similar cases like that as well. Um, I, the thing is that, that 
having discrete memories of a past life is uh, not very common. So the, the idea that there would be two people, uh, two children, very close together who remember the same life, um, it's just the odds are sort of against it. So it may well be that the kids did share a life with their playmates, uh, but just that the playmates don't remember it. Mm-hmm. Because we, some people were asking this also. Report they say example for example those who uh, die together in a very for example let's talk about the Holocaust and then they are reborn and then probably they report a similar experience or something that they actually live together but it's a very hard uh, case to come across right? Well, that's right. So like I, there's a case I saw in Thailand where the the boy was a twin and he described being killed when he and and the friend of his were i think stealing cattle or something and what he reported was that the friend had come back as his twin brother but the twin brother didn't have any memories himself so it may well be that they had traveled together but just that only one of them actually had the memories hmm that's interesting now finally dr tucker what are the new perspectives in the research of reincarnation? What is left out there to pursue? Well, I think a couple of things. One, um, I'm going to continue to pursue strong American cases because I, I do think uh, increasing the collection of strong American cases, I'm hopeful, will continue to make an impact. Mm-hmm. Uh, beyond that, I, I want to continue to explore this issue of mind and, and uh, sort of what we are at, at our core and, and trying to sort it out more. I mean, the, the consciousness world presumably is not as linear and straightforward as we might like it to be, and, and there may well be things that we can never understand about it. But, but I'm hoping that over time we, we can try to sort out the issues at least a little bit more. Mm, that's so interesting. So in that regard, the dynamics of the mind, the research of reincarnation. What would you like to share as your final comment for Kardec Radio's listener today? Well, I guess I would like to share that uh, with these cases, there is very compelling evidence that a part of us continues after we die. No doubt about it. So, Dr. Tucker, we are very honored for having you here once again. We hope to have you back as many times as you can to remind us about the fact that reincarnation really exists and there is compelling evidence research-wise telling us that we live life time and again. Thank you so much for being with us, Dr. Tucker. Thank you very much for having me. So, dear listener, here we are. We talk about reincarnation and it's beyond belief. It's about a fact, facts that were proved by the group of Dr. Stevenson, while Dr. Tucker was also participating on it, and now he's the leader in this research worldwide. Well, the holiday season is coming along, and there is there are many gifts you can give to people, but this one special. The book by Dr. Tucker, Return to Life, Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Previous Lives, Cases of Children Who Were Born in the United States, Remember Previous Lives, and they are sharing this with you. And this is serious research. We would say, read this book. Share it with others. You don't need to say anything. Just say, read it. And it's fascinating because it's going to turn to ourselves and tell, well, if I have lived more than this life, why am I here? This is why Spiritism is here for us, to bring us about the implications, dear listener. If we live many lives, what is that all about? Just to experience and that's it? Or is that much more than this? Well, read the cases and you see that there are many interesting points that will lead to the direction of the implications on living life after life and growing strongly as a human mind, a human heart. We're going to give a last break, and when we come back, we're going to tell you what's going to happen next week and our final prayer after the break. We will return to our program after these messages. Getting to the Light. 
Spiritist Therapy for Discarnate Spirits is a small book that offers guidance to Spiritist practitioners and Spiritist counselors. Purchase your copy at www.ssbaltimore.org. Nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. If you missed out on any previous shows, no worries. We have an on-demand section of all previous shows and interviews. Go to our website at www.cardacradio.com. Spread the word, Kardec Radio, to learn more about Spiritism. Help prevent suicide by reading and sharing these books with others. Two great books are available to help in this Kardec Radio campaign to prevent suicide. Suicide, All You Need to Know by the international spiritist speaker Richard Simonetti. You can buy your copy at www.roundtablepublishing-uk.com. Also, Memoirs of a Suicide by the medium Yvonne Pereira. Buy your copy today at www.edicieofamerica.com. Kardec Radio, live every Saturday at 11 a.m. Kardec Radio now offers more programs during the week and weekends. Every Wednesday at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can follow the beautiful program God at Home with Francisca Kranz and the British Spiritist community. They will brighten your days by doing a God at Home meeting wherever you are in the world while teaching you how to do the same in your own home with your family and friends. Every Thursday at 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, you will hear incredibly inspirational Spiritist talks directly broadcasted by Spiritist Network. There will be true educational moments to carry out to immortality. Every Saturday, live interviews, bridging health and Spiritism with the host Dr. Vanessa Anceloni. You may ask questions to the interviewed guests by calling 858-769-4705. And every Sunday, tune in the Spiritist Awareness at Kardec Radio. You will hear a series of segments on a diversity of Spiritist topics. Kardec will broadcast the Spiritist Moment with Kirsten DeMello, the reading of the Spiritist Book by John DeRosa and Steve Shepard, Spiritism in Your Life with Drs. Marco and Joyce Magalhães, Spiritism and the Gospel with Luis Sergio Marotta, Spiritist Education for Youth and Children with Bernadette Leal, Spiritist Music with James Marotta, Neuroscience and Spiritism with Dr. Vanessa Anceloni, and many more segments coming soon. Enjoy it all and nourish your soul with Kardec Radio. And now we return to our program. Dear listener, we talked to Dr. Jim Tucker about this book that was just released, Return to Life, Extraordinary Cases of Children Who Remember Previous Lives, Cases of American Kids Who Remember Previous Lives. This is a scientific research, very serious one, that has been led by Dr. Stevenson and now continued by Dr. Tucker. We would say that it, there is compelling evidence about reincarnation, many things to think about in our lives and the implications of it. As Ellen Kardec says in the Spirit's book, when we talk about reincarnation, we are talking about the justice of God. God being so provident and so compassionate that gives us a new opportunity to begin anew, really anew, in a new body a new setting, new family, new opportunities, coming across our shortcomings from a new perspective, trying to grow stronger and develop our potential. We know that life goes on, not only in the physical form, because it's passing, but in spirit, which is the real, true life. To talk more about this in a week from today, we are going to have here at Kardec Radio, a couple, Tom and Lynn Janelli, 
the authors of the book Death at the Movies, and they will discuss how much Hollywood itself talks about life after life, the life in the afterlife. It's a popular uh, belief that has been explored by Hollywood, and they have written a book that dedicates on how much Hollywood explores this popular belief, and sometimes people are not fully aware that it's being spread out by Hollywood more than any of these books that we have written. And they're going to be here with us talking about this very topic, which is quite interesting. In the meantime, as we prepare for this holiday season, it's a moment for us to ponder what we have been doing about our lives. Not to be harsh on us, but to adjust, realign whenever possible. And in that regard, dear listener, we ask you, we deeply ask you, think about this with your family. And that's the reason why we're going to play again. People have asked, we're going to play again for you. This message that you can find in the book and CD, Enlightening Messages, compiled and sold by the Spirit Society of Baltimore. Go to the website, ssbaltimore.org, buy your copy today, Enlightening Messages, and give it as a gift to your friends and family. It's a beautiful CD to have it in your car, at home, to rejoice your your heart, especially in this Hollywood, in this in this season, in this holiday season. So listen to this again. Christmas card. It was psychographed by the medium Chico Xavier. Christmas card. At the dawn of Christmas, which awakens in you the music of hope, listen to the voice of someone who searches for the nest of your soul. Someone who lights up the star of generosity in your eyes and sweetens your feelings as though he had a harp of tenderness hidden in his chest. Yes, it is Jesus, the faithful friend who has returned. Even if you did not want to, today you would remember your sacred graces. As you recall your mother's songs at your cradle, your father's care when he held you in his compassionate arms, the patience of the teachers who guided you in school, and the pure love of old friendships that appear to you to be far away. You contemplate the street where lights and carols honor his glory. However, you fall over the weight of tears which cleanse your heart. It is so because he speaks to your soul pleading for forgiveness for those who stumble, help for those who suffer, a coat for those who tremble in the vastness of night, consolation for those who groan discouraged, and light for those who lay in darkness. Do not hesitate. Hear his petition and do something. Smile again at those who have offended you. Bless those who have wounded you. Share your bounty with your brothers in need. Give one minute of solace to the sick. Offer a piece of bread to those who pray alone above ruins and abandoned bridges. Extend a soft bedsheet to those who await death without the coziness of a home. Give up a small sum of your wallet towards helping worn out mothers who suffer seeing their small children squirm with hunger or make happen the happiness of a forgotten child. It does not matter if you say that you cultivate goodwill only today when Christmas shines on you. Let's start to live with Jesus, even if it is for a couple of hours every now and then, and we will learn little by little to be with Him always, as much as he is with us, coming daily into our intimacy and sustaining us forever.
So, dear listener, at this very end of the show, we pray. Pray that our dear Almighty Father blesses Dr. Tucker, his team of researchers, and every researcher and scientist around the world who is leading this research on reincarnation. May humanity give way to this evidence and the implication of it so life becomes much easier dear Lord may we surrender ourselves to the continuity of life by adjusting ourselves to the understanding that life goes on that the passing moments and resources we have here shall be cherished with the unique goal of progressing, helping one another. And at this very moment, we join our thoughts and our feelings, asking that all children around the world may be given a new opportunity to grow strong to be loved and an opportunity to serve you dear Lord on the earth May we expand the possibilities of our lives by working hard to build the kingdom of your world in our hearts. And so be it. Dear listener, in a week from today, we're going to talk about the book that talks about death at the movies. The, The couple... Tom and Lee Ginelli is going to be here with us talking about how much death and the afterlife and life after life, reincarnation, is being talked about and explored in the movies in Hollywood. Quite interesting, never talked about before at Kardec Radio, and we hope you come here and enjoy. If you have any questions, suggestions, comments, just write to us. Cardecradio at gmail.com or go to cardecradio.com. We have a contact form. Just write it down. We'll be happy to listen from you and already preparing you in your heart for the holiday season and for the new year that is very soon about to begin. We wish you lots of blessings and don't forget your relationship with God is all that really matters in this world. Thank you for listening to Kardec Radio, broadcasting live every Saturday morning at 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Email us and share your comments at www.kardecradio.com. Until next time, we wish you many blessings.